Hello, everyone. Welcome back to your Plant Science 333 class for spring 2024. Uh, today, I'm going to be going over a little bit about respiration, respiration just as a review. So what is respiration? It's the process of plants using up the sugars made through photosynthesis and turning them into energy for growth, reproduction, and other life processes. So all of those sugars that we've accumulated through photosynthesis have to be converted into ATP or energy for the plant to use. So I have here the general reaction that happens in respiration, which is taking glucose, C6H12O6, and oxygen and water, and through respiration, converting that to carbon dioxide, uh, more water, and energy that can be used by the plant. So this reaction should look familiar. It should look like the inverse of the photosynthesis reaction. So here you see that you know photosynthesis was taking carbon dioxide and water and light energy and creating glucose, that C6H12O6 molecule, and then also having water and oxygen as a byproduct there. So what purpose does respiration serve in the plant? So it has two primary purposes, production of energy or ATP from stored compounds such as carbohydrates and photosynthates. So through the oxidation of your carbohydrates, that's how you're going to get that energy. And we'll talk about that process. And it provides carbon compounds for other structural and functional components of the plant cell. So it provides these like building blocks for cell synthesis. So like amino acids um, for proteins, your fatty acids for lipids, component acids for nucleic acids. Um, so that's for your DNA and RNA. Uh, yeah, all really important aspects of plant synthesis. So where and how does respiration occur? Respiration occurs in all plant cells. So that includes your roots, your stems, your leaves, everything. Every plant cell must respire. But within each individual plant cell, respiration occurs within the mitochondria and the cytosol. So I've included a picture of a mitochondria here because its anatomy is going to be important as we move forward. So just be familiar that within a mitochondria, you know, you have this outer mitochondrial membrane. And that's what separates the mitochondria from the rest of the cell. Uh, you have an inner mitochond mitochondrial membrane, and that holds your mitochondrial matrix. Okay, and these little folds are called cristae. So, respiration can be broken down into three steps. And here, you know, we have a very intimidating-looking graphic, but it's actually quite simple. So, step one is glycolysis. Step two is the Krebs cycle. And step three is the electron transport chain. And we'll talk about how, what each one of these cycles does and how they all work together. So step one, glycolysis. Where does it occur? It occurs in the cytoplasm. So if this whole picture is within your cell out here, all this pale yellow is going to be your cytoplasm. So that's where glycolysis takes place. And what does it accomplish? It's breaking down your sugars, so that C6H12O6, your glucose, into pyruvate. And it does that using an enzyme called triose P. Um, and that will use two ATP of energy, right? So it's using two of those ATP molecules to accomplish this. Uh, but through this process, we're going to produce usable energy. So it'll actually net two ATP per glucose molecule and it will produce uh, these compounds that we'll use in step three of respiration, the electron transport chain, uh, NADH. So it'll also produce NADH for the synthesis of other cell components. You know, We mentioned that can be used in, in both those ways earlier. So glycolysis, just to review, takes place in the cytoplasm. It's the first step of respiration. So step two, is your Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle or your tricarboxylic acid or TCA cycle. So it goes by many names, um, but it happens in the mitochondrial matrix, okay? So that's within here, right? And what it accomplishes is more production of ATP. It's gonna produce another two ATP per glucose molecule. And it's going to make more NADH and FADH2 and both of these are going to be used to make more ATP in step three of respiration. 
Um, it's also used in the synthesis of other cell components. So we can see here, you know, we're going from glycolysis where we take our initial glucose, it's broken down by our triose P enzyme and converted into pyruvate. And then that is going to be transferred into the mitochondria, into the, your mitochondrial matrix, where this Krebs cycle will take place and produce another two ATP and more of these compounds that will be used to make even more ATP in the future. So it starts with this investment, you know, in glycolysis, uh, and then it just kind of keeps building interest, if you would, for ATP. So here we just have a few more um, pictures that will help you identify or understand the Krebs cycle. So here's that pyruvate, okay? And that's from your glycolysis in the cytosol. It's going to pass through into your mitochondrion, into the um, mitochondrial matrix, right? And through this, it's going to lose a couple NADHs and it's going to make acetyl COA, right? And from that, you're going to enter into the actual Krebs cycle. And this is, you don't need to memorize any of this, but if you're interested, there it is. Um, but it's going to go through eight different forms and to release this ATP and more NADH and FADH2. So why is it called the tricarboxylic acid cycle? I'm sure you're all asking yourselves and, you know, maybe this isn't representative of what you look like, but it could be. And it's called the tricarboxylic tricarbo acid cycle because citric acid has three carboxylic acid functional groups or COOH, right? And so you can see that here's your carboxylic acid. So that means that it's oxygen double bonded to carbon and then a hydroxide ion that's single bonded to carbon. And we can see that there's three of those, you know, here's one, here's two and three. So that's why it's called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And finally, that brings us to step three, your electron transport chain. And where does that occur? It occurs in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So that's that inner layer here, all right? And what does it accomplish? So all that NADH and FADH2 that we've been producing in glycolysis and the citric acid cycle uh, creates an unequal proton gradient across the mitochondrial membrane. So there's going to be more protons on one side of the mitochondrial membrane than the other. And the potential energy created by this proton gradient, so this difference in potential, it's converted into usable energy, ATP. And it's in this process that a majority of the ATP is produced in the electron uh, or in respiration. So a majority of AT ATP is produced in the electron transport chain. And we have right in here that 26 to 28 of the total, you know, 30 to 32, some people say 34 ATPs per glucose uh, come from the electron transport chain. So you can see, you know, it's electrons carried over and it all happens here. So here's a nice representative figure. I know it's a little grainy, but I think this is a really, really great um, picture to help you understand. So what's happening here is we're, we're taking uh, those compounds from the mitochondrial matrix and we're pumping out our hydrogen coming from NADH and FADH2, right? So we're pumping out these positive uh, protons, these hydrogen ions, right? Because a hydrogen ion is a, is a proton. So we're pumping those out, okay? And electrons are traveling along your uh, inner mitochondrial membrane, all right? And then they're gonna come out here in the synthesis of ATP, right? And you know, now we're finally using that oxygen that we talked about way earlier in the first respiration equation. Before that, the oxygen hasn't been used, but we're using that oxygen in the synthesis, in the synthase of ATP. So a fun fact about the electron transport chain, and maybe it's not very fun, but a lot of poisons actually work by disrupting this transport chain. So like cyanide, you know, super common poison. Um, yeah, it renders your cells incapable of producing energy, and that's how it how it does you in. So just to review here, another big you know surface level uh, overview of respiration. But you have glycolysis is your first step, right? So we're taking the glucose from photosynthesis, right? So we've made all this uh, glucose in photosynthesis, and we're breaking it down into pyruvate, all right? So to do that, it costs two ATP. So we're gonna invest that ATP 
to break down pyruvate and it's going to give us back four. So we get a net of two ATP from this substrate level phosphorylation. Now we're going to transfer that pyruvate into the mitochondrion, right? In the form of acetyl-CoA. So there's a couple enzymes that will break down that pyruvate, form acetyl-CoA. That will go into the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, we'll go through those eight different forms that we've talked about. It will release six NADH and two FADH2s, right? And we have those listed up here. And it will also produce two ATP. So all of those will head over here to the electron transport chain where this ATP will be synthesized and there will yield about 34 ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. And with all this ATP, this ATP is then used, it's transferred out of the mitochondria and it's used in a ton of different biochemical reactions within the cell. I mean, it's what keeps the cell alive. So where are some environmental factors that can affect respiration? Number one is temperature. Number two is oxygen and carbon dioxide. And number three is light. And we'll, we'll talk about light, you'll see. But temperature, generally, higher temperatures will correlate to higher respiration rates. Of course, if you're cooking the cell to where it can't survive, you know, then that, that won't be it, you know, if you're breaking down your enzymes. Um, but generally, as, as long as you're not cooking it to where you're breaking down enzymes, higher temperatures are going to correlate to higher respiration rates. Why is that? Well, higher temperatures, we kind of already mentioned this, mean higher enzymatic activity to a point, right? So enzymes are used in, the enzymes used in photosynthesis reach optimum efficiency around 30 degrees Celsius, and enzymes used in respiration reach optimum efficiency around 35 degrees Celsius. So I want you to recall that plant growth can't occur unless photosynthesis exceeds respiration. So we're talking about the accumulation of sugars here. So you need more sugars than you're burning so that you can actually grow. And we kind of see this here in this um, graph. I think it's a really nice graph. And it shows your gross photosynthesis and your respiration rate and then your net photosynthesis here, okay? And this is all on a temperature range. So as temperature increases, you know, phot photosynthesis is going to keep rising to a point and it's going to start to level up. We're going to start to, to reach our optimum and then even eventually this would start to, to go down, right? As we get hot enough that the, the enzymes start to, to break down. Um, and your respiration here is going to start off very slow. You know, at cold temperatures, it's not going to be respiring very much. And then as it heats up, those enzymes are going to, to really start kicking in. And we see that at around 35 degrees, you know, it's already, it's exceeded our gross photosynthesis. So at this point, we're using more sugars than we're making in the plant, right? And here you kind of see that net photosynthesis. So that's going to be your gross minus your respiration. And we kind of see where it, where it peaks and where respiration will start to exceed it, you know? So what are the implications of this? What does this all have to do with production or growing or what? Uh, cooler nights tend to be better for plant growth. I mean, when photosynthesis is impossible, we want cooler, but you know, not necessarily cold temperatures to slow down the rate at which sugars are consumed. Slowing down sugar consumption leads to greater carbohydrate accumulation, which leads to greater osmotic potential, driving the uptake of water and contributing to greater turgor pressure, which then leads to plant growth. I'm sure you guys, maybe you haven't watched the water videos yet, but when you do, you'll learn about osmotic potential, um, water uptake, and the need of turgor pressure to lead to plant growth. But the idea here is that we don't wanna use more sugar than we have to, especially if we're not making sugar at that time. Um, so what is this, how does this relate to a global scale? Well, climate change poses a really large threat to this. As we have these warmer nights and hot days, you know, those uh, enzymes that contribute to respiration are more optimized and the enzymes uh, that contribute to photosynthesis are less optimized. So it's really, really an issue. Um, we're going to see less fruiting, you know, lower yields, uh, all around just worse for plant growth. So continuing on, on colder nights, you know, sugar accumulation is necessary for the production of fruits, for the creation of flowers and the addition of color to crops. I mean, you need sugars 
to make anthocyanins and other pigments, you know, carotenes. Um, so this will affect things in production. Like, you know, if you want deep red apples in the Northwest, there's a reason why apples are so popular in the North, you know, they have their, well, one, they have their uh, chilling requirements, of course, but then having these colder, colder nights helps them develop like deep red pigment or other pigments um, for poinsettia production in your greenhouse. You want to make sure that you're, you're getting the temperature down when you're not providing supplemental light or at night. Uh, to make sure that you get those red bracts on poinsettias. So in other words, if your respiration is equal to your photosynthesis, your poinsettia will never get that nice coloring. It'll just be green. Um, and then less colorful trees in the fall. So what gives trees those nice, you know, yellow, orange, uh, red colors on their leaves in the fall is anthocyanins. And if it's hot nights throughout the entire summer, um, you're not going to get that accumulation, especially if it's a short fall as well. You know, you won't get that accumulation of anthocyanins and then you'll just have prickly necrotic leaves. <laughs> so what are the implications for this? Um, how can we present or prevent it in a production scenario? So post-harvest storage is really critical to maintain the quality of the crop. You know, increasing temperatures leads to increased resp respiration and the breakdown of sugars. So that's gonna to lead to shorter shelf lives. So to reduce the effects on respiration and improve shelf lives, you know, we there's a couple strategies we can use. So pre-cooling, which is the, this is a, in general, pre-cooling is the rapid removal of field heat from harvested fruits and vegetables prior to shipment. Um, so we wanna be doing that obviously. And to do this, you know, you can harvest at early mornings to avoid excess heat in the day, um, you can put plants on ice. Uh, you can subject them to hydro cooling and vacuum cooling. And we'll talk about that a little bit, or even just air cooling, you know, pushing air through a storage area to try to cool it down. So hydro cooling, you know, you might not be familiar with that. Um, it's essentially just dousing the crop in ice cold water. So what this is going to do is just, you know, absorb heat directly from the crop. You can see in this picture here, uh, they're usually like on a conveyor belt kind of thing. You'll stack crates up on it if it's a large scale production and they'll go through and be soaked with water here. And then vacuum cooling is uh, the rap rapid evaporation of water from the crop due to reduced pressure. So you can see it's kind of a grainy picture, but you can see they'll, they'll load in the crop here. This door will shut and it will create a vacuum within it. And this will use evaporative uh, cooling. So, you know, we're, we're using that uh, vapor pressure deficit, which I think you guys have, have learned about or should be familiar with, to increase our, our transpiration, which is going to cool the plant. You know, we're using the, the latent cooling of evaporation here. So oxygen and carbon dioxide can affect respiration here. And we can kind of see why in your respiration reaction, right? So for us to burn this glucose, you know, for us to process this glucose, we need oxygen. Well, if you don't have oxygen, clearly respiration won't occur. And to reduce in this, uh, in this high concentration of oxygen, we can use carbon dioxide. So as oxygen increases, it's more available, which makes respiration easier. And as carbon dioxide increases, it makes oxygen less available, inhibiting respiration. So it's really this kind of ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide that can help us control respiration. So there are some strategies that we can do to reduce oxygen effects. And one of those is controlled atmosphere storage. So this is essentially just a room in which you'll control the atmosphere. So you'll manage the concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, by increasing concentration of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. So we're just putting in more nitrogen and carbon dioxide so that in, in relation to oxygen, there's less oxygen, right? Uh, but you do have to be careful with this. You have to be aware of lowering the oxygen too much or anaerobic respiration can take place and that's fermentation. So we don't want that. And then light. Uh, so there's a, not a lot of stuff out on light. You know, it's still kind of a loosely understood topic, which is very exciting. But slower respiration rates can offer survival advantages for plants living in deep shade conditions. I mean, if you're in deep shade, you're not 
having as much photosynthetic reaction within your plant. So you're not producing as many sugars. So this low respiration rate using less sugars will be beneficial. But reduced respiratory rates in low light might also just be due because be due to the fact that there is not a lot of carbohydrates there, right? Like we're not producing a lot of sugar. So there's nothing to respire. So it's kind of a, a chicken or the egg scenario there. It's not a very well understood relationship, which is exciting. I mean, maybe maybe one of you guys can research that. But so just a nice review to wrap up. Um, remember that our respiration reaction is glucose, C6H12O6, and oxygen and water. And through our glycolysis. Krebs cycle and electron transport chain within the mitochondria. We are given carbon dioxide, water, and most importantly, energy. And there are three factors that can affect this temperature, oxygen and carbon dioxide ratios and light. So thank you for listening. I hope this was a beneficial little uh, respiration video. And feel free to stop by my office hours if you have any questions. They're on Tuesday and Thursday from 2.30 to 3.30 in 2.58 Plant Biotech. Um, feel free to make an appointment if those times don't work for you or just shoot me an email if you want any clarification or help with homework or whatever. So thank you very much.